928-8822 or visit heartdrop.com. Extend your life with Extend the opinions expressed on this radio station, its programs, and its website by the hosts, guests, and call-in listeners or chatters are solely the opinions of the original source who expressed them. They do not necessarily represent the opinions of Revolution Radio and FreedomSlips.com, its staff, or affiliates. You're listening to Revolution Radio, FreedomSlips.com, 100% listener-supported radio, and now we return you to your host. Stumbling down the road with Bridget Lynn Dolgoff as she carries stones, digs holes, and wheels her shovels on her way. This road is the real path. It is never easy and never clear, but always entertaining. This journey has not been a seated event as Bridget walks, runs, stumbles, carries, digs, drags, laughs, fights, sings, prays, dances, kicks, screams, and oftentimes falls. Hi, it's Chief with the Bomb. Hey. Hey, so I'm just getting ready to open the show, so hang on one second. Hey, everybody. Okay. <laughs> hey, everybody. This is Carrying Stones and Digging Holes Radio Show on Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com. And uh, I am Bridget, and I bring you my radio show, uh, 1 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time. Um, you can go to Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com. And uh, you can click on our funding page. We are listener supported 100%. Everything that everyone does on our network is 100% volunteer. And we try to bring you as much, you know, information and education and amazing people as we can. And uh, if you go on the, the main page, look under the link um, schedule and you'll see schedule A or studio A or studio B. Click on studio A. Scroll down to the 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You'll see a bee with a flower. Click on it. There's um, information about me, the show, and if you want to contact me. So anyway, today I have a return guest, and uh, he is one of the original founders of Food Not Bombs. And uh, hey, Keith, how are you? Very good. Uh, going uh, really well. Awesome. Are you still in Santa Cruz? Yes, I am. I'm on Pacific Avenue right now in Santa Cruz. <laughs> right. So do you guys do your, you guys do your, um, you know, your, uh, you know, your homeless uh, buffet today, don't you? Yeah, yeah. We'll be feeding probably 200 people at 4 o'clock um, Pacific Standard Time here in Santa Cruz. And then another another 200 people tomorrow. Wow. And that's the last week, weekend of the month. So we typically have a lot more people come to eat um, and, uh, towards the end of the month than we do at the beginning, which is about 130 to 140 people at the beginning of the month. And um, this is, uh, we're in the, uh, we've been doing this for, well, in Santa Cruz, we started in 92, but we started putting on bombs in 1980. So we're ent- going towards our 40th anniversary. I know, that's incredible. I mean, another thing, too, is listeners who are out there, I mean, Food Not Bombs has also been international for how long, you think? Uh, Yeah, in 1992, we had our first international gathering, and and international at that time meant that we had a group in in, uh, Prague, Czechoslovakia, a country that doesn't exist anymore, and um, now it's Czech Republic, and... uh, 
And then also we had groups in Melbourne, Australia, and Victoria, British Columbia, the Brixton neighborhood in uh, London, England, and then groups in Boston, New York City, Seattle, Portland, Long Beach, um, San Francisco. So that was uh, the 92 gathering was the first international gathering that we had. And it was international mainly because uh, we hoped other people from other countries would come, but really only some people from Canada came to make it officially international. Yeah, I mean, last time I had you on, we talked about how in the 80s, you know, there weren't homeless people, um, not at the capacity that there there are today, and it's exploding. Yeah, you know, the thing I, I was just listening to the, um, you know, I listened to those uh, debates for the Democratic Party, you know, candidates. The only person that mentioned homelessness was Bernie Sanders, and he used the... Uh, the statistic half a million people live on the streets tonight, um, which is uh, the whole population issue. And particularly when we're like talking about, um, you know, the having the national census and everything is kind of interesting. So, you know, before the, in 2007, the number of homeless Americans living on the streets, according to the federal government was 750,000. It has stayed static, according to their statistics, from 1989, um, when it was first um, announced that there were 750,000 homeless Americans. And then the 1990 census confirmed that there was at least that many people. So then you have a housing foreclosure crisis in 2007-2008, and suddenly the numbers go to 500,000 homeless Americans, which is tragic enough. But it's pretty clear that that by refiguring the way to count people living on the street, that they're able to reduce the homeless census by 250,000 homeless Americans at a time when the homeless crisis was forcing tens of thousands of people in the street. So it's kind of, you know, it's not logical um, from a, just a statistical point of view that we now have many less homeless Americans today than we did before the housing crisis, you know? So, these, um, you know, this is an unfortunate thing because in a certain sense, it, um, by downplaying the total population, which is in the millions, there is actually one HUD report that says there's 2 million uh, homeless Americans under the age of 18. And then there's another HUD report that says there's half a million homeless Americans and then, of course, there's all kinds of ways of defining what a homeless person is. Like, are you a homeless person if you live in a car? Or are you a homeless person if you live uh, in somebody's uh, couch for like a week? And then, you know, that kind of thing. So there needs to be some kind of <clears throat> really accurate way of, of determining the population. And the, and the reason that that counts, even though it's just tragic enough for one person to be homeless and and suffering um the the issue is funding and political will when you think that there's not really very many people living on the streets that means that the political will to actually provide solutions uh is diminished and so that's that's why i think it's important to to realize that there's probably uh you know five or six million homeless americans maybe even more um and, and uh, that we know for sure, according to the federal government, that there's at least, uh, you know, nearly half of all Americans are living in poverty. And that half are people that are um, in danger, like, uh, of becoming homeless. All there needs to be is, like, a, a car breakdown or a divorce or a medical emergency, and you could end up on the streets. And so there should be really strong solidarity between those renting and housed people and those living on the streets, because it could happen to any one of us. Yeah, no, I've I've been, you know, pretty much living out of my car um, since probably 2006. And there were just a lot yeah. of things that happened. I mean, the big one that happened was um, that the state decided to come after my private practice. And for no reason, totally illegally. Um, and uh, tried to pass... A complimentary medicine bill, which would have eliminated all alternative medicine. Having vitamin C would have been a felony in the state of Nevada. 
So I was on the front of that and just haven't ever recovered. You know, you can't recover after like your whole life has been destroyed. <laughs> who you are. Yeah, the, yeah. Yeah. The stories of the people living on the streets are just like so diverse, just like yours. I, I, I run into people who um, I run into a number of, of uh, alternative medicine people who ran into difficulties through licensing some things and ultimately move to a car and then move to the street. Um, you know, there it's, uh, you know, that's the thing is that the people that are living on our streets are the people that actually made America and their parents made America and their grandparents made America. They're the people that, that created the, uh, you know, the, you know, alternative healthcare systems that we can enjoy when, when we're not being harassed or the people that are actually built the buildings or, um, you know, paved the streets or, you know, grew the food. Yeah. Uh, these are, you know, that's who's living on our streets. And to, um, so right now there's a, I've just been involved in a, well, we've had a, a brutal campaign in Santa Cruz where there's an attempt to gentrify the town. In fact, many, many businesses are slated to be, bulldoze to build high rise condominiums, waterfront condominiums on the river and including our kitchen where we cook every Saturday and Sunday. And, um, and, and there was just a sale of a data collection and anal analyzing company here, uh, called looker that was sold to, um, to, to uh, Google for 2 billion, Six hundred million dollars, and so that's the kind of pressure that this community is uh, living under. Is the fact that the rents are just going they're going sky high, and there's like actually a nationally coordinated campaign to uh, eliminate homeless people, and it's kind of uh, frightening. And I've been feeding people for forty years. And so I've seen the trends. And in 1986, there became a very huge threat, uh, campaign nationwide to demonize homeless people. This is at the end of, uh, of six years of Reaganomics, um, neoliberal structural adjustment, the uh, shutting down of public housing, meant, much of which should have been shut down because it was horrible, but uh, not replaced with new uh, alter of, uh, you know, um, affordable housing. Wages stayed stagnant. And so the homeless population just ballooned and they created this theory called the broken window theory. And that theory uh, claimed that the presence, in part, that the presence of homeless people, um, low level crimes like sitting on the sidewalk, which shouldn't be a crime, but is in most cities, or, um, you know, sleeping outside, things like that, it had to be strictly enforced because if you didn't, stop people from breaking the tiniest of crimes, then it would lead to just a, a world of total chaos where people would be, you know, raping and killing one another. So that theory, the people that put out that theory and advanced it is the Manhattan Institute and other think tanks. And now they've come up with a new theory, anti-homeless theory, which is very well coordinated, which includes a movie called Seattle Dying, which claims that the everybody's moving out of Seattle because of the presence of homeless people and that the city will be dying. It's a Sinclair broadcasting, um, uh, film that just horrendously dehumanizes people living on the streets. And then there's a, a companion study, um, which by the Manhattan Institute, which claims that people, uh, the, the affordable housing won't help anybody because the people living on the streets are all drug addicts and on heroin and therefore will um, never get a job and will never rent an apartment. So why bother um, actually providing housing for people? And yeah. so I think that's the, the next thing is the rounding up people living on the streets and putting them in tournament camps. Well, no, that's already, I, uh, that's something, you know, I haven't talked to you in a while, but there were a lot of things I wanted to talk to you about before, you know, um, one of the things I want to tell listeners right now is that um, the stuff that we've been seeing in the Reno area, you know, for the homeless, same thing. We have the city development that has, you know, 
is tearing down everything old. They're tearing down all of the weekly rentals in the whole area. They're almost all gone. And so all these elderly people who've been living on very minimal social security, been living in a lot of these weekly rentals, now have no place to live. So these are people, a lot of elderly people. These are people, some of these people have uh, doing the, you know, Food Not Bombs in Reno. Um, you know, a lot of them are um, veterans. Um, the other thing that there are a lot of homeless people is that they have jobs. Some of these people have jobs. But, you know, it's yeah. like, do they feed themselves and pay for their medical care? Or, or do they put a roof over their head? I mean, those are like the choices that they have to make. And, um, and so that's kind of like what's happening. But I met uh, Keith um, during, I don't know, my first or I think my first living experience in Taos for a while. One of the things that happened to me in Taos in 2007 was it was a catalyst, you know, it was a catalyst period for me because in Taos during that time, you had all these amazing people. Keith McHenry, he was living there. He was uh, had this um, kind of building and he was creating an area where people could come and actually have talk about things that were going on, talk about the, a lot of the food issues, creating food. Um, and he was working on a world peace conference uh, at that time as well. Um, and so I was down there. And so I was going to the public theater place that they had and watching documentary after documentary and all kinds of different councils of different people dealing with the nuclear problems, the this problems, this problems. And, and I learned so much. I was so heavily educated during that six month period. Um, and then also going to uh, Keith's place that he had where people could go. And this is where I really think, like, uh, I was talking to a friend of mine about this yesterday, Keith, that, you know, when I was there and I was, you know, taking all this stuff in and talking to a people, because uh, there were quite a few amazing people in Taos at that time. I don't know what it's like now, but, um, and it, like, places that I was stuck in me kind of broke open through all the information that I got there in education that I'm pretty sure it has slingshotted me into everything that I've done. I've gone to, you know, Steiner College and studied Steiner because I wanted my focus to be on biodynamics and farming and how are we going to fix the soil, how do we restore it. And then, you know, like I'm in an herbalist program and I'm mostly using it to go out and look at plants and figure out how to collect the seeds, you know, and then be able to go other places and repopulate these plants in areas that these areas desperately need those plants, you know, as well. Um, and so there are a lot of things that I've been doing since 2007 was, I think, a lot of the direction that's unfolded is, was because of the impact. And so you were part of that, Keith. Um, wow, thank you. Yeah, no, um, it really changed my life because I, there were so many things I didn't know. You know, I wasn't, you know, even though I was like 40 years old, I hadn't really had a very good education. I hadn't had an education in the nuclear issues. I hadn't had an education in a lot of the issues. And I, I there I found out, you know, that I was buying what everybody else is buying, which is this information that they want you to see and hear and believe. And a lot of it is untrue. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, the way um, that society is organized and the media and uh, education system is uh, organized is definitely to promote this vision that there's really only one way to exist. And that is in a um, the type of economic political system that we have and to have a, to give in the, you know, to give the impression that we have a democracy to give the impression that, uh, that, uh, the way that capitalism is organized is the only natural way that, uh, all other ideas of that are, are, are you know, just completely out, out of, uh, the realm of possibilities. They're just ignored. You know, I remember my dad when he was, uh, he was a Republican He's a, you know, he was actually would have not been a Republican had he just not, I think, met my mother's uh, father, my grandfather, who was a Republican. Uh, he just assumed that there was Republicans and Democrats and then all other ideas were the same. That a socialist, that a communist, that an anarchist, that a libertarian, that a, 
you know, humanitarian, that uh, any of the other economic and political philosophies were the same, that there's only three philosophies, Democrats, Republicans, and, and everybody else, and everybody else was evil, and they were somehow lumped into the communist uh, of Soviet Union type vision. I think many Americans, that's essentially the, the way that they perceive the world, and that's uh, intentional, that there be this drumbeat of, you know, the Democrats versus the, you know, the Republicans, who essentially are in the same economic and political, uh, you know, world. There's, a, um, you know, fortunately, there's becoming somewhat of a uh, more sharp delineation between those two parties. But in the final analysis, they're both for uh, large corporations um, doing very, very well. And, uh, and that, the, that the, if, for instance, there's going to be an ecological solution to climate change, that's going to be through more investment in um, products that will somehow relieve us of this crisis. And that the and and that any kind of fundamental giant shift in in perspective is just not even to be uh, considered. That it's automatically fringe, and um, if it's even uh, mentioned at all. So, you know, I could, and that's why we started the Taos Beach House and Info Shop was uh, renting that house right on the main street so that we could bring in the main, you know, people in the community who. Um, and people just driving by to come and question the way society is organized and to come up with new ideas of how to, how to go forward. Yeah, I think there is one, uh, you know, I can remember that there was, um, when I was going there, you know, to the, the Taoist house that you had. And, um, the other thing that I really felt that was phenomenal, which I didn't really understand at the time, it's really taken me a long time to understand the type of, I don't know. Um, the cool thing about Food Not Bombs is it has designed its own structure. And the structure is a no structure. <laughs> yeah. And so there is no business licenses. There are no, um, you know, um, contracts with any states or um, there isn't anything going on. The thing about Food Not Bombs is it is self organized which means that you decide to go help or not help and um, you can show up with any kind of food so when you show up to feed like in Reno food not bombs Reno you know in our area it's more you just cook what you have what you know is affordable you know try to stay as much veggie and, and vegan as you can but we we don't deny any donations because sometimes we have tons of people that have to be fed and um, um, and you show up, you don't coordinate. Nobody really coordinates. Um, you just show up what you have to give. Um, and that's kind of it's self-organized. Um, and you participate when you can. You participate as much as you can. Um, and you just pick up jobs. Like, for example, one of the things that I did was because I um, have an actual nonprofit. And so what I did was I helped assist us to uh, work with Petco getting uh, food donations for the dogs. And they ended up giving us like leashes and collars and stuff for the homeless doggies so that they met, you know, more of the, you know, Washoe County animal control um, things, you know, so their animals were on a, a leash and collars. But I took that upon myself to go do and get it done. Um, and so you kind of work together as a group, but you do what you want to do, what you feel like needs to be done. And you just go out and do it without having to talk to everybody about it. Um, it makes it a lot easier. Uh, there's no administration and everybody can give at the level that they need or want to give. And when they have time. And yeah. So, yes. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, so that, I mean, that's the reason we're in a thousand cities and uh, 65 countries is because the basically the the principles um, are that the food is free is uh, actually the principles vegan or vegetarian and free to anyone, rich or poor, drunk or sober. Um, and uh, definitely, I can see that uh, you know people do modify things, but uh, you know there that's uh, the first principle, and then the second principle is that there's no leaders, headquarters, or uh, d directors that we encourage the people that live on the streets or need the food to participate in 
in Food Not Bombs as equals, and that we are uh, uh, not a charity, but that we're a, not, a um, nonviolent direct action to change society. So it, it, every community just, you know, uh, under that rough uh, uh, outline of principles and can create their own Food Not Bombs. And if we had had a leader or headquarters or a president, then it would not spread all over the world. People wouldn't feel the self that, the, you know, built into the, into the three principles is um, that you do it, that you have the freedom to do it yourself. And uh, we were really big on DIY music when we started. Um, you know, we were, orga- we were like real active in the punk scene and organizing our own labels and our own shows and, and kind of a resistance to signing with, uh, you know, with Atlantic or uh, Columbia Records and stuff like that. And, uh, and so we're the sa- we have that same uh, philosophy, and that has made it go global because people will, you know, it's, it, it can be adapted in a Hindu uh, community. Can be, you know, it can be adapted in a Muslim country like Indonesia. You know, it can be adapted to a, a wealthy country like Finland. It can be uh, organized in a poor country like Kenya. Um, you know, it can be, it, it, it just is flourishing because the main thing is that you yourself take responsibility to make it happen and you do it with people um, as equals. And, and I think that, that that in part is also why the government is so uh, concerned about the existence of food op bombs and why they have done so much to try to stop us in, um, with the uh, over 1,000 arrests in San Francisco from 88 to um, 94 or the arrest in Fort Lauderdale, or the arrest in Orlando, the, um, you know, that kind of thing. It's because it is a, there isn't like a leadership that they can uh, demonize or a leadership that they can put in prison and kill the old organization or, um, and also the, the this, it's not, you know, from people in power's point of view, having low income people um, organize their own solutions is a is quite a threat, and uh, and so I think that that has played a big role in the repression. But the repression has also played a huge role in the fact in how we've become global, because people obviously are outraged that anybody would, any police department would go in and stop somebody from feeding the hungry when the government itself is doing relatively little to end hunger. I mean, at least they do have food stamps and. And they do provide some local assistance to uh, local shelters on occasion and, and so on. But, uh, you know, we got millions of people looking for food in a country that's the wealthiest country on earth. Yeah, but all the money goes to the military. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> does it go just to imagine. the people? <laughs> yeah, just, you know, I went to um, the... Um, Poor People's uh, Congress in Washington, D.C., I think it was last week. And I went there um, as uh, uh, at the invitation of the uh, one of the coordinators of the California Poor People's Campaign, uh, Anthony um, Prince, who's also um, a street lawyer that's helping us with a federal lawsuit uh, against the municipal violence uh, towards homeless people in Santa Cruz. And that lawsuit is actually having some uh, success. And I think one of the most important areas of success is the fact that here the city council and the staff have demonized the people living on the streets. And um, they actually put out, they actually shared the movie Seattle dying uh, to their constituents to try to build more hatred towards people living outside so they could then implement more laws and, and, and policies against the people living outside. And, um, so anyway, he, at his invitation, I went to this, uh, with a a woman that lives on the streets here, Alicia cool, who's also, uh, the president of the Santa Cruz, uh, homeless union. And, we participated in that. And one of the beautiful things was that the poor people's campaign has as its moral budget that 
$300 billion be taken from military, uh, the military budget and placed into things like education, health care, and other social services, which is exactly what we've been saying now for 40 years. And the fact that um, that's a number of Congress people at a congressional budget hearing were also advocating a diversion of $300 billion from military spending towards education and, and social services. But pretty, pretty inspiring because that's been a 40-year effort to try to make this part of the public debate. Yeah, but I mean, the thing is, is like what's happening is all the political wealthy people, their areas in California, um, they're having, I mean, they had what, they've had like, um, what is it? Um, they've had the, um, you know, outbreaks of different things and, and the people that um, I think it, what, what was it in LA? There were uh, some of the people that worked at the city hall areas uh, that were starting to get some of the flea bites from some of the, you know, what the homeless people are dealing with down there um, with all yeah. kinds of disease and finkdom matter. So the prop, I think what really helped you, which is sad or California is that it had to get to a certain point that it was impacting the legal, political, and you know, wealthier people in some of those bigger cities for them to actually put pressure on and actually, you know, get some money allocated to start helping. Well, that's an interesting situation because um, the, it, um, you know, the the city of Los, Los Angeles actually did a bond measure and uh, and had a couple of policies to put, I think, almost $2 billion into affordable housing to deal with the crisis. And yet, um, real estate interests were able to block the implementation of that. So there is, there's $2 billion available, but they have yet to build one unit in, in over, I think it's like over two years, they've not actually built a unit. And there, at the same time, this, the people who are involved in demonizing homeless people have started a recall campaign against the mayor because he was trying to get the affordable housing produced that was voted on in this, um, um, you know, by, by the citizens to deal with the, the crisis. But they cannot find a single place to actually cite any kind of uh, single room occupancy hotels or shelters or uh, tiny houses or any anything in Los Angeles because of um, of uh, very strong um, real estate and business pressure um, to and, and a lot of money being dumped into campaigns to make sure that these solutions do not happen and that parallels the same thing that happened here in Santa Cruz where there's a recall campaign for the two city councilors that were proposing um, transitional camps, that were proposing studies on how to create affordable housing, increase uh, single room occupancy hotels, uh, provide shelters and navigation centers. And the recall campaign is uh, specifically says they have to get rid of these two city councilors because they supported the um, solutions for homelessness. And so they have, they turn out they have access to the funds that were spent to defeat rent control in Santa Cruz. And it's the same people building these luxury condominiums on the river. And um, then there, in Chico, there was the uh, campfire, which burned down the entire town of Paradise, California. And that was a working class uh, uh, community. In fact, many of the people at Paradise were actually former residents of Santa Cruz and just couldn't afford to live here anymore. And so they uh, bought or rented a place up there. The whole city burned to the ground. Uh, the water is such that it can have, it's going to be years before the uh, uh, water can be put back online there because of the, all the pollution and problems of the, that the fire itself caused. And so uh, roughly... Uh, I don't know how many thousands, but maybe in the area of about 20,000 people became homeless within two days, um, three days time. And now many of them moved to the town of Chico, which was the next largest community. And we're living in the Walmart parking lot 
until they were kicked out of that. And now the, um, there's a recall campaign there for the two, the mayor and the city council that advocated the building of a shelter and some other, and solutions to, to help, uh, you know, reduce the, the suffering of the people that lost their housing that are now living in RVs and then tents and so on throughout Chico. So those three recall campaigns have, uh, um, you know, a similar theme almost exactly, which is that the homeless, uh, that these politicians were advocating policies to uh, solve the homeless crisis, and therefore they need to be pushed out of office. Yeah. Um, oh, hold on a second. So, yeah, well, we here in the Reno area, we um, got a huge amount of um, a lot of the people that lost all of their properties and houses in the fire the year before, the Sonoma fires. Um, right, a lot right. of yeah. they still they the you know they're being messed around with and a lot of them have had to flee that area and because they've kind of lost everything and they won't pay them out on their land they're trying to sell their land and they're not getting paid out on it so a lot of them came here and got jobs there was a huge flux of people that migrated here um, and then a lot of them you know are are homeless uh, and then with the Paradise Fire. You know, a lot of them um, couldn't afford, you know, they had to figure out where they could go within, you know, their areas uh, that they could afford. And so a lot of them came here and were homeless. Um, and um, and also now I'm starting to see a huge influx all of a sudden on a lot of the roads, um, RVs from California with California license plates. So there's a huge like migration of pe people that are headed this way. Um, but our winners are, you know. Last year was pretty brutal winter. Yeah, see, that's a, it, it is um, a frightening thing. We have a lot of paradise uh, refugees here in Santa Cruz, too. And then what I've been noticing is also, um, and you may see this in Reno, and I, and um, this rather dramatic increase in women, single women in their 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s who are becoming newly homeless. Many of them have been coming to me saying that uh, that their rents were increased by 500 a month, and they just couldn't meet that expense, and so they moved into their car, and they and it would be like within 30 days they'd be out. No time, and they, here in this town, it's really hard to find a place anyway. And then, um, but their job is still here, and so they don't want to leave. And then what happens is that their cars get eventually, there's a campaign here to ticket people that look to be living in their cars. And so they'll give sometimes uh, five or six tickets in a day, sometimes even more, uh, until you're uh, eventually you're financially ruined and you, you can't register your vehicle. And therefore, then they confiscate your vehicle. And then you move into a doorway. And then you could be on a list for housing, and that list can uh, it frequently take three years. You know, you can be on the – if you get the voucher, you can have it for three years. But the uh, likelihood of you getting housing is uh, virtually non-existent, well, and then yeah. you get bumped off. Well, another thing, too, is um, here, uh, like three years ago, somebody was telling me for certain types of, like, welfare housing, Section 8, depending on, you know, where you're at in it, um, it, you're on a list for like six years. And, yeah. um, and the other thing that was pretty, um, crazy, um, was that, you know, we had an older lady, you know, that used to come for food, not bombs. And, and one day she finally, she said it took her five years. She's like in her seventies, but she finally got into some kind of senior housing and was finally getting off the river. She lived on the river for five years through brutal winters. In massive, you know, poverty. Yeah. Um, I mean, we were all super happy, you know, for her. Um, and, yeah. I mean, the, you know, the thing is, you know, in Reno, they're doing the same thing as Santa Cruz. You know, they tore down the um, Greyhound bus station that had been there forever. And a lot of the things that, you know, where more homeless people or people that are kind of living on the streets, you know, areas and then they're going to build high rises because this is their their idea well if we build it to look really really nice 
then the people will help, help us with laws to be able to get rid of these people in this area. And and it's like the, totally the wrong way to look at it. It's like in America, just the birthright of being a citizen, that means that the country is supposed to, you know, help. Right. That's what, yeah. you know, a lot of these people who are homeless have paid taxes, you know, in some way, shape or form. Um, and, you know, sometimes people just have hardship that they need to be helped. And because we are a capitalist society, everything costs you money. You know, nowadays you can't even like camp. When I was growing up, I remember, you know, my, we were poor and I remember, you know, camping for two months one time in KOA and I suspect that we were probably homeless, but back then we didn't call it homeless. Right. <laughs> um, it was like a vacation <laughs> anyway, but you know, it was cheap enough that my parents weren't, they were trying to get jobs and where we were at, they obviously could afford it. And now, I mean, you know, like an average camp area that may be in a safe place in case it's a you know kind of a rough area i mean you're looking at like 35 dollars a night 25 dollars a night yeah. we're places yeah. in canada you can still go into the areas i mean you will never own the property but you can legally squat for a duration of time i've had friends that are canadian that got a teepee and went into the forest and lived there and learned how to be sustainable and grow things and raised her daughter for 18 years and then moved out of the forest when she was done you know we don't have that yeah. kind of stuff in the united states and you know the yeah, no. is a rich problem um, because, you know, we could really cut down helping the homeless with garbage if they would actually provide, you know, areas for them to throw away the garbage. And number two, provide them things that they need, like food and proper, you know, some clothing. I mean, thrift stores could get together and put together a whole bunch of clothing where the homeless could go and pick through and take what they needed. And Talos, that, you know, the thing is, Talos, like, was a, a game changer for me. Um but they had the free box. And so everybody donated everything, the free box. And you go there from like nine to five, they'd open the fence. It was locked up at night. And then you could get a couch or a TV. I think I outfitted and even gave myself a whole new wardrobe from the free box. In yeah, yeah, here, yeah, here we do the, the really, really free market every Saturday and Sunday during the meal. And we have this big tarp we put out. And then people from all over the community know to bring uh, clothing, sleeping bags, blankets, and, you know, like books. And and uh, even occasionally we get car parts and stuff. It's kind of funny. And then, um, and that's become like a, a super um, important aspect of the local Food Not Bombs. And, uh, and the fact that people, we, you know, we put the word out amongst people to do yard sales and so on. Just bring your stuff you don't need, don't sell at the end to our free store, uh, really, really free market. But it, um, you know, the, the, it is outrageous that we've been that we criminalized people for living outside. You know, and, and um, I noticed what I like was laying on a bench in Orlando, and a ranger came up to me and said, "Oh, you can only have uh, one third of your body horizontal to the earth." But that's a, a, a city law. I mean, that's insanity that that's even considered a, a concept. And um, you know, so we've like criminalized people just for the fact that they don't have the resources to rent an apartment. And, um, you know, and then yesterday we were, we we're like organizing, uh, there's actually a committee to reestablish the national union of the homeless. And so hopefully there'll be a, a, a Reno, um, homeless union that, uh, can affiliate with the national. And, uh, right now in California, there's a Chico, uh, group of Marysville, a Santa Cruz and a Salinas. And we're hoping to build more, to uh, organize more unions of the homeless throughout the state. And the other thing that we're doing is that we are, because of the uh, Martin v. Boise ruling in the Ninth Circuit, which uh, states that you have to provide indoor housing for all the people living outside. Um, and, and if you don't, then you can't be ticketing and arresting people for living outside. Um, and uh, there, the city municipalities in, the, in California, like Santa Cruz, have actually tried to reinterpret the Boise ruling. And that's why we're in federal court. And they're trying to claim that you could just, instead of a camping tickets, you could just give people trespassing tickets and other tickets 
and then it will be in compliance with Boise. And they also, in the eviction of the, um, take care, Gail. <laughs> in the, the, uh, in the, in the, um, um, you know, leading up to this and why we filed the lawsuit was there was a homeless encampment, the largest uh, continually um, inhabited homeless encampment in, in uh, the history of Santa Cruz with at the top population of being about 300 people. And uh, we called it Heroes Camp because when it, uh, it started when the municipal um, campground, which costs $1,500 per person to fund, you know, you could actually rent an apartment for $1,500. So they have your own bathroom, own bed, electricity, and water. But here you could live, uh, the city paid $1,500 a month per resident to live in a pup tent with a portable toilet. And um, it did for a while have a shower, but they shut that down after a few months. And people ended up, of course, moving back onto the streets. And a bunch of people moved behind this uh a uh, mall called where uh, Ross Dress for Less is. And while they were living there, there was a multi car major accident right next to them. And a bunch of the people living in that camp climbed the fence and saved the lives of a group of children in a van and another man in a car. And who, these two vehicles caught fire and exploded, and they would have died. So we called it Heroes Camp. And the people living there. Had, were all, even on Fox TV and stuff for being heroes. And that actually opened the door for that camp to exist for um, almost a half a year because it was hard for the city to justify kicking these people out. But became a huge um, political football. And um, the city uh, in federal court um, in uh, um, San Jose claimed that they were, they were going to shut this camp down, bulldoze everything, and that they were, everybody could go get their belongings. Uh, they would hold it for 90 days and uh, that there would be adequate housing for everybody once they're evicted. <clears throat> we argued that that was actually not true because they, were, they would let, name a shelter, say, well, there's a, 60 spaces at this uh, armory that you can sleep on the floor from... Uh, uh, you know, you had to get out at, at six o'clock. You had to meet a van in town at six o'clock to get a ride to this armory. And that that was somehow adequate housing. And um, that the, it turns out, though, of course, there was already 60 people in that shelter and there were 60 people in the other shelter and there was no actual, um, you know, adequate housing. And they lied about it. And of course, once they clean, like swept the camp, just as we had testified in court, the people were forced to move to doorways all around town, which they did. And now the local people are angry that there's, you know, groups of people living in every doorway in the center of town. These are the people that were living at Ross Camp. And we had actually tried to negotiate, as you said, like get trash pick up there. We tried to get a dumpster's place there. Um, the city was not cooperative with that. We tried to get support to make it a safe and sanitary area. They would not help us in that. <clears throat> Their goal was to get rid of the homeless from the city. And many of those people were born and raised here. So, um, you know, this, and, and I would, I just say this because this is similar to what has happened in cities all across America. And most, uh, I assume in Reno, um, what happens is there's a lot of dialogue in the media about homeless people in Reno but it ends up being like the whole problem is in Reno and it's not anywhere else. And, and, uh, and it's that because, and that's what happens in every city. I, I remember when I was homeless in Cleveland in the middle of the, in January and the people in Cleveland were telling me how all the homeless came to Cleveland because they had the best soup kitchens in, in the, in the country. And I'm going, well, it's five degrees outside. You know, I'm freezing. I'm not so sure. The only reason I'm in Cleveland is I'm on my way somewhere warm. <laughs> and that was on the route. So um, Yeah, there was, a, there was a reoccurring story. Um, so not this winter, this last winter, but the winter before, I was really heavily involved with Food Not Bombs because they were both really wet, cold winters. And um, the uh, I kept hearing the same story. So last 
uh, a year ago, April, um, th it was in the New York Times, and they said that Reno now had the largest homeless population per capita in the whole nation. Um, so just to give out that kind of a statistic of, you know, kind of like, you know, what's happening here, but we get a lot of transient people, um, that in coming here, you know, come here, um, and then they get stuck here. And, um, one of the reoccurring stories I kept hearing from people for a while, you know, as these new people were coming in was that they were told by law enforcement and um, political people and, you know, people that would come and talk to them at other homeless camps, like say LA or all some of these other places where they're at, that they, if they could get to these several cities that were mentioned, including Reno being one of them, um, that Reno was offering free housing to all homeless people, which is totally untrue. And so a lot of these people, you know, hitchhiked and migrated and walked to Reno uh, and got stuck here because everything that they were told about it was a lie. Yep, this is uh, all across America. This is what's happening. You know, we and, and then um, even like the, the people that are trying to drive the homeless out of Santa Cruz are claiming because we have all these great services and anyone can get a meal and anyone can get a place to live and so on. That That's why all the, you know, we have the greatest homeless shelter, which we actually um, don't. Uh, and, and, you know, that all this was, is why everybody's moving to, to Santa Cruz, but actually not nearly as bad as cities like uh, Reno. P cities that are on national arteries like Interstate 80, of course, are going to have people stuck there because people are going to, you know, I hear all the time that, oh, there's like, I, uh, we actually helped the guy that lived on the street here who um, get off the streets. And it took, and basically we just, the big trick there was we stored his belongings so he would could go out and look for work. And, um, and, and he came here because he saw, he came from Florida. And he came here because he saw in the news that there was all these floods and all these buildings falling into the rivers. And so he's a builder and he thought, well, I'll just go to California. I'll get work building, rebuilding these houses easily. And then he gets here and he didn't really realize that there was actually, you know, how expensive it was to rent an apartment. And uh, he had a really difficult time, but he eventually did get off the street. But I hear this quite frequently too. People come here thinking that there's going to be a job. So it's, it's uh, completely reasonable that you might be going across Interstate 80 and you finally just don't even have the resources by the time you get to, to Reno to go further. Or like you say, people fleeing California because they know all the rents are terrible here and they'll never get off the street. So then they think, well, you know, where's the price much better? And then I'll go to... Uh, you know, go to Nevada. We hear that in, the, in also in Las Vegas, you know, has lots of people that are just trying to get out of uh, California thinking that, well, it must be cheaper to live in Las Vegas and get there and they still can't rent a place, you know? So this is a pattern is, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. it's in the, in the grapes of wrath is a, a totally the story of people going up from, uh, you know, traveling across the country to California to work in the fields only to find that they're going to be in a homeless camp, you know? So, yeah, I mean, this is mm -hmm. yeah, decades so we're gonna, of this. Yeah. So we're going to go to break at 56 till, you know, and I'll let you know that. And then just, if you can mute and then come back at, um, 1101 or, you know, and then we'll go back on for the second hour. So we've got about one minute, but I was going to say, um, I was, wa I was watching this, um, video. These guys, this guy has these, uh, videos on YouTube and he's sort of a prepper, but he's, he's more like a historian and he specializes on the great depression. And he put out a video recently that was kind of mind blowing because he said that every prediction of the Great Depression is happening now. And he talked about how many people were homeless in their cars, you know, right up before the big Great Depression. Um, and that he yeah. believed like this was a catalyst, like that was happening. And, um, you know, how bad, how serious, you know, basically the real economies are in the United States and what's getting ready to happen. And it, it, he said yeah, it's a I lot like 
Great Depression. People lived everywhere. They lived in tents on the side of the roads. I mean, part of history that we're not told about. You know, they yeah, um, think, lived yeah. in cars, whole families. Yeah, I think we are totally. See, this is one thing, and I've been speaking. Oh, hey, about hey, can we talk about oh, this? We gotta go? we, yeah, okay, okay, we're on. No problem. Uh, hang on. Okay. Hang on. Hang on and mute. We'll okay. come back and love you. Keep that thought. Great. looking people out there in Revolution Radio. This is Mario. I invite you to join me Thursdays at 6 o'clock for this, that, and the other. It's a show about you, it's a show about me, but ultimately it's a show where we try to have a little bit of fun. We discuss important topics and we do our best to be apolitical. So I invite you, put on your favorite pair of comfy sweats, your smoking jacket, and grab a beverage of your choice, and join me Thursday evenings at 6 o'clock for this that in the other on Revolution Radio. Enter into a world unseen on Raven Star's Witching Hour. You will encounter eclectic topics from the realm of spirit brought into our matrix of truth. With your host, the Solaris Blue Raven. Solaris will bring you an array of unique guests covering topics from ghostly spirits to amazing anomalies, covert technology, UFOs, and shadowy global events. And that's right here at Revolution Radio FreedomSlips.com, Saturdays, midnight till 2 a.m. Eastern Time. Revolution Radio, where information never sleeps. Let the magic rise. <laughs> From the astral realms to the physical plane, the halls of power to the walls of home, the multiverse to the innerverse, all will be haunted by the ghost in the machine. I am Steve Zeraloff, the ghost in the machine. Mondays, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Studio B, exclusively here on revolution dot radio continue <laughs> Extendivite really works. Just listen to what some people have to say. Several years ago, I was developing a very uh, severe situation. I called it my flippy heart. It would just was doing not good things. And I did not want to go to a medical doctor because uh, I just knew they would give me a cover-up pill. I didn't want to get onto that sort of thing at all. When I learned it was garlic and cayenne, and cayenne is a healer. It is a wonderful herb. I said, I think I'm onto something here. I'll tell you, I wouldn't be without it. It did wonderful things for me. Extendivite is only $69.95 for a two month supply of either capsules or liquid. Call now. That's 1 877 928 8822 or visit heartdrop.com. Extend your life with Extendivite. 
opinions expressed on this radio station, its programs, and its website by the hosts, guests, and call-in listeners or chatters are solely the opinions of the original source who expressed them. They do not necessarily represent the opinions of Revolution Radio and FreedomSlips.com, its staff, or affiliates. You're listening to Revolution Radio, FreedomSlips.com, 100% listener-supported radio, and now we return you to your host. Hey everybody, this is Bridget Lindog, off the host of Carrot Stones and Digging Holes Radio Show. And we are on the second hour of our show. I have a guest, um, Keith McHenry, one of the original founders of Food Not Bombs, and we're having a a really good conversation, a conversation that's really difficult. I find it's very difficult to actually have with other people. So um, it's really great to get um, some perspective um, on homelessness and, you know, um, all the other issues that go on along with it and what's happening around us. Um, you can go to Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com, and you can check out our funding page because we are 100% listener supported. Uh, everything we do, we volunteer to help you try to bring, you know, all of our hosts, uh, we all do this for free, to educate the people and also, you know, bring important, I think, information to the public. Um, so, you know, there's all kinds of ways that you can um, utilize our funding page um, from heirloom seeds. Uh, we also have some advertising and just all kinds of different stuff. So um, take advantage of that for us. Um, also, you can go to Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com. And on the left-hand side, you'll see a button called Schedule. Click on that. Studio A. Uh, schedule A, go all the way down to 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You'll see a B there. Click on the B, and you will find information about the show, about me, and if you want to contact me. So anyway, we're talking about um, things that related to the Great Depression and how we're kind of um, in some of those predict identifiers. Um, and so you were talking about what? <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, you know, the thing is, Mainstream economists are now talking about what they call a a recession, which would be much more brutal than the Great Depression, you know. Um, And I believe that, you know, if you in studying, um, you know, what these people are saying, the the conditions are, uh, just as you say, ripe for a Great Depression. And um, one of the things that, that, you know, what, before the Great Depression, Hoover, for whom the name Hooverville uh, was named after, had a lot of the same economic policies that we see today with as far as uh, trade wars. Um, there's also a lot of uh, ecological crises going on with the you know, dust storms in, in, the, in, uh, mid, in the Midwest. And then there was a banking-inspired uh, for housing foreclosure or and farm foreclosure crisis that was happening. So all of these things uh, are, are are indications that we are about to go into a Great Depression. And then we could also see, as you were mentioning, you know, the number of people living on the streets and cars and so on is very similar to what the conditions were before the economic collapse. And um, I think now, though, that this collapse will be even more severe than the Great Depression. And I do believe a lot of uh, mainstream economists are, are also predicting that. And that um, and, and the issue, though, that I think is not totally connected to that economists are not connecting is the ecological and climate change crisis that's happening at the same time. So the magnitude of all these problems are much greater than they were in the uh, late 20s, early 30s, and that we can anticipate millions of Americans joining us on the streets. And um, so that's, I think, one of the inspirations, for example, for uh, re- reestablishing the National Union of the Homeless, because we're already at a point where there are millions of people living on the streets. And that's likely to only get worse with the um, conditions that we're facing now. So I think your your description of that from the um, video that you were watching is completely accurate. And I and I and you know there was a um, 
uh, Duke University just published um, a study that they've done for years where they interview the CFOs and CEOs of all these large corporations, and all of them were saying that we're going into a sliding into a recession. And all of them also agreed in this study that, uh, or a huge percentage, and I forget what the total number of, of CFOs that uh, uh, believed this was, but um, that the that it will be much more dramatic than the Great Depression. So uh, that's why these kind of, you know, uh, I, this is why I think that there is now this new strategy to claim that all people living outside are heroin addicts or mentally ill, and therefore should just be interned because um, there's not going to be a wi- political will by the one uh, percent to actually solve the problem. They're not going to give up their resources or or anything, and um, just to to help with this. There's no money. Uh, you know, here we in uh, in in solving this problem. Um, there's money for shelter operators temporarily. And they just definitely just spend their turf, um, but there's no money in really providing solutions. And, and an example is there's a church in downtown Santa Cruz, Calvary Episcopal Church, who owns a pr- piece of property next to the church, which they rent to the city as a um, um, for a parking lot. And they've actually have plans already designed to have senior housing on this piece of property, affordable senior housing. And there's a couple of really beautiful senior housing programs here in Santa Cruz, um, and, and which uh, are very well supported. But what they found out was that they could not get any bank, including a California um, affordable housing bank, to invest in building this building even though the land is already owned the um um you know the the plans for the building have already been paid for uh they just can't get the construction funding for it because the banks including this nonprofit bank that funds housing affordable housing programs said that it's just not economically feasible and uh, there's another project that's been in the pipeline for 100 uh, single room occupancy units ne- next to the property, next to the um, homeless service center, which they cannot get funding for either. And that's gone on for years. So you have a confluence of nimbyism, people that don't want housing put into their neighborhood for low-income people. And then you have banks that refuse to invest in the building of low-income housing because they won't make enough of a profit on their investment. And then you have a a well-funded campaign to demonize the homeless, which is largely being funded right now out of the National Association of Realtors and some other developer uh, associations who had spent hundreds of thousands of dollars in Santa Cruz to defeat rent control rent control that would have affected 5,000 units in the city of 63,000 people um, spent so much money they could have actually housed all 5,000 people for the amount of money they spent on trying to defeat this uh, uh, rent contr- very minimal rent control proposal. And, um, and now they're taking all the slush fund money from that and putting it into this recall campaign. So there's a very, very well-financed, and well coordinated, and Food Not Bombs in Denver was actually involved in a campaign called Right to uh, the I think Right to Survive campaign, uh, Proposition or Initiative 300, and uh, people there voted to uh, to continue the harsh anti-homeless laws in in Denver. Um, I think many of us uh, might have seen the video at three o'clock in the morning where the Denver police arrive in a blizzard to an abandoned lot where about 10 or 15 tents were set up and forced everyone to take down their tents and pack up their belongings in sub-zero weather in a blinding blizzard. And I, that was the kind of uh, uh, home, anti-homeless sweep that inspired the idea of trying to make a, a law that the city of 
Denver had to uh, actually abide by the Martin v. Boise case in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, and yet it was defeated. Yet the uh, Magic Mushroom ordinance in the same election was uh, overwhelmingly voted for. And that's like, I mean, I'm all for magic mushrooms, but in decriminalizing, you know, nature, that's like, a, you know, certainly a good idea. But to, um, you know, to continue to criminalize people that are falling through the cracks and living on the streets is, uh, is kind of uh, uh, depressing that that vote went that way. Well, I think that they have to, I, you know, I think that there's like several things going on. I think that a lot of the politicians and, you know, people that we rely on or get voted in are criminals. And I think that they, they've been in criminal activity. So I think some of it is an attempt to hide what's going on from the public. And then I think there are a whole bunch of people who are like totally in denial and it can't accept you know, because it would ruin their little perfect life and their American dream kind of a thing to know about the other things that are going on. I mean, in a large amount dealing with the homeless. And so, so yeah, so this is kind of what came to mind. I have a little anxiety about talking about it, but it's kind of a rabbit hole that I've been going down. So, you know, it appears, you know, that there are a lot of countries that have been following a lot of international economic stuff and just different countries moving away from the U.S. dollar. And recently, they pretty much all moved away from the U.S. petrodollar, which was the only thing that was really circulating the U.S. dollar. And so now that a lot of them have abandoned that ship, you know, it's starting to dawn on me that they were watching this ship sink. And they needed to get out of it, off of it as fast as possible in order to minimize the blow. Because the U.S. goes down, everybody else was tied into it, right? It would just be a massive devastation to a lot of other economies. And so a lot of countries have, like, moved off. So I've been watching this go on since, I don't know, 2013 and the move away. And then this week... I was listening to a guy who, uh, AMTV News, and he reports a lot of really great stuff, you know, really underground stuff. And he was talking about how all of a sudden there's admittance from Russia that they are using planes to come by and they're photographing areas of the United States. And I guess a whole other con- other bunch of countries are involved in this. And he was asking, you know, like, I thought we had to be like private airspace, you know, how can, you know, other countries' governments be photographing, you know, the our country and all this other stuff and it it kind of dawned on me that (laughs) i have a little anxiety it dawned on me that other countries are trying to figure out how to prepare for the nightmare unbelievable apocalyptic scenario that is going to happen in the united states so other countries are already trying to prepare for you know what i mean how they're going to because otherwise, the whole United States, everything in it is just going to totally implode. Yeah, I think that that's, um, there's a lot of evidence to, to not only the collapse of the United States, which I think we could see even just walk out the, your door, um, if you have a door. Um, and, and, uh, and yeah, there was a, and the newest thing that uh, just happened in this week was that there um, became an alliance between South America and um, the EU, where and they actually announced that this currency uh, that that South America is switching over to the uh, euro as a currency. Um, um, you know, uh, instead of the dollar, was it directly done specifically to counter the United States and its economic policies? And they also, part of it was to continue to um, invest in, in um, places where the U.S. has sanctions, like Russia, like uh, Iran. And so that they, because that those uh, economies are economies that the European Union wants to do business with. And the United States, in this last uh, desperate effort to maintain control of the world currency, has started putting these sanctions on, on all these countries under different excuses. Uh, you know, like, I think that it's, uh, it's pretty clear that the uh, Russian 
manipulation of the election is essentially a very minor league compared to um, disruptions of the U.S. election by corporate power, which bought, buys the election. You know, the, a small number of, uh, of crazy memes on Facebook is not swing the election towards uh, Donald Trump. It was clearly a very bad candidate that virtually no one supported um, be hijacking the electoral, the um, Democratic Party nomination process. Um, and at the same time, um, you know, uh, you know, advocating policies the American people don't want and that it was, and that they believed that well, Trump was so psychotic, no one would ever vote for him. Not realizing that he was actually saying stuff that people, uh, you know, that was of interest to people's daily lives, like getting rid of the, the you know, NAFTA and the, um, and, you know, the uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership and things like that. That so the corruption is just so immense within the political system that that's really why we have have like the the chaos that's going on now because no one's really willing to face the facts of of how the society is organized and they just uh, want to hold on to that and then and and um that to that is uh you know t- totally uh you know that why like the other countries are just like fleeing the united states and and trying to set up their own economic uh interactions and so on just to stay away from this total chaos that we're facing here. I agree. I mean, we're the world's largest economy, but we're also the economy that um, has the largest prison population per capita in the world. We also, at one point, we were one in two prisoners on earth were in prison in the United States until China finally uh, caught up, and now we're only one quarter of all prisoners on earth are in prison in the United States. Well, but that's, I mean, that shows people how how bad the economy really is because basically, you know, they use the prisoners, uh, you know, in the United States as free labor for a lot of um, things that are exported outside of the U S. So, you know, basically we're a prison population, you know, in slave labor. I mean, you know, places like San Francisco, they still say that there's like underground, you know, um, labor. I mean, we have one of the largest countries of um, human um, um, transporting humans. Um, what is it? What's it called? The uh, human trade or whatever? Um, human, I mean, human trafficking. Yeah. Yeah, and we have eight hundred um, thousand missing children a year in the United States. I mean, hello, <laughs> hello. Yeah. I mean, the stuff that's going on in the United States, I think if people could wake up, would shock them. I mean, shock them. I mean, I still find out things that, and I'm pretty well read these days, travel, you know, it's pretty brilliant circles, but there are things that, you know, catch me off guard about what's going on. Well, here's a tragedy that, you know, we, uh, it's very tragic that, well, first of all, we've caught horrible, the United States like bombed the, and, and funded um, death squads and so on in, in uh, Central America for decades. You know, hundreds of thousands of people were killed and their economies ravaged and, and destroyed um, in behalf of U.S. corporations that wanted cheap labor in, in El Salvador and Guatemala and Honduras. Then um, there was a Hillary and Obama sponsored a coup to overthrow the government of Honduras. And now that's got spun out of totally control and total chaos and people are fleeing there. And of course that's directly linked to why people are trying to get into the United States and are dying on the border. And then, and, and that whole thing. So there's a huge responsibility that the U S has on, uh, um, behind that. And then, you got children in cages, thousands and thousands of children in cages that people die because of an immigrant detention centers and massive increase in the construction of immigrant detention centers. But the part of the story that's not being told is the amount of homeless people who are losing their children by virtue of the fact that they are just homeless and their children are confiscated because they do not have a safe place to live indoors. And, uh, we, you know, I met a, a, a young mother yesterday who um, had her uh, newborn taken from her right after birth and is now 
um, disappeared into foster care system somewhere. And then for 30 days, she's been struggling to try to find her child. And, um, she's not a lot of, they've been, she's been told she's not allowed to have the child because even though she has a tent in a city operated campsite, um, which now has 61 people of the 1000 people living outside in Santa Cruz living there, it's, uh, there's a rule against having children in the camp. So she had had to lose her, her newborn to the foster care system and to who knows where the child will ultimately disappear to. And this story, uh, even though that happened to be the story I heard yesterday, is a story I hear often. And uh, men, anybody that becomes homeless with children then has to live in fear that if anybody finds out that they don't have a place to live, their children will be disappeared from them. And there's millions of, of, of people in that situation in the United States. And it's unknown, really, the amount of children that have been taken from their parents because the parents do not have the resources to rent an apartment. And, um, you know, they, and I, you know, fortunately, these children are not in cages, but they are separated from their families and they're separated from their families for much the same reason that the people t attempting to enter the United States as refugees are losing their children. And then this refugee crisis is, uh, you know, homeless people in the United States can be called uh, internally displaced people, uh, according to the United Nations. And there are giant refugee camps throughout the world now. And the United States should actually, sadly, start building its own refugee camps that are self-managed by the people living in them, as opposed to these concentration camps. And I think that that's sadly that if we do not organize um, the, uh, as uh, unions of the homeless, as food not bombs chapters, as um, just people of goodwill against the um, patterns that are happening here in the United States, we are going to see that it's okay to round up homeless people, put them in tournament camps, and have them work for free for U.S. transnational corporations and um, U.S.-based transnational corporations. And I think that's ultimately um, the fear of many living on the streets. You know, we'll see, like, the city council talk about, well, we went out to interview the homeless about what they need, and no one talked to us, and we don't know what's going on. Well, of course they're not going to talk to them because, um, the smart solutions thing that they have or smart pathways is uh, definitely um, a way of, of collecting data on the people that live outside and then so that they can figure out who can be diverted into these camps so that they can then, uh, you know, be the best uh, free workers possible for corporate interests. And I know that sounds sort of like Nazi Germany and uh, – and a little outrageous, but if we're okay with interning people trying to flee the, into the United States, we will be okay with American workers being forced into camps to just to get, um, you know, a, you know, a cotton and five meal or three meals a day, um, you know, as uh, somehow the better than having to. Uh, live in a tent on the side of a street being woken every hour or two by cops who are giving you tickets and fining you thousands of dollars because you can't find an apartment. Um, you know, then we have the issue of the, you know, when the Seattle dying came out, um, there's a chant, there's people in that movie that chant, it's not a homeless problem, it's a drug addict problem. And that, you know, derived from this Manhattan Institute study that uh, claims that the people living outside are all on drugs and, and will never get a job. I mean, how many people do we know that live outside have three jobs and still can't afford an apartment? You know, I mean, I know many, many, many people that, um, you know, many of our volunteers that have full-time jobs that volunteer with Food Not Bombs live outside. And, um, you know, so this is totally normal. Um, and normalized in this society, but I think we really need to push back and be concerned that we are facing a future where it will be okay by those that are housed that their unhoused neighbors be rounded up and placed into internment camps.
Well, but I, you know, I, I've already seen that internment camp thing happen. Um, I actually had a friend of mine who was a engineer. She was an engineer on the railroad. And during her 20 years, she had to run, you know, she had to ride the railroad lines, right? That was part of, of her job. Um, and she said that, you know, like, you know, 15, 18 years ago that she started seeing um, these, you know, fenced areas, just like in Germany, <laughs> that they did, you know, uh, with the Jewish populations and other populations that they didn't really want to deal with. And, you know, like in Nevada, out in the middle of the desert, right off the railroad. And um, yeah. so she said that, you know, she saw a lot of them, but it wasn't anything that she could talk about. And then when she retired, you know, she talked to a few people that she knew about it, but she kept that, those secrets for a long period of time because she didn't really know what to do with them. Um, and then also, you know, we've seen a lot of the people vanish from this area. So, I don't know, 2016, a lot of the outside kind of areas off Keystone um, here in Reno and down Dickerson um, and along the Idlewild Park. I mean, there were huge amounts of homeless people and they had carts and um, they were all over. Then all of a sudden you started seeing the police come in. I was staying over in an area where I had to drive through a lot of that. So every day I was watching more of them disappear. I was watching police show up to areas. And then the next thing I know, all the people are gone. Then within like a week, all the cars and the RVs have been towed away. And then they have, you know, hazmat teams come in and, and throw away all their stuff. And so, I mean, we were getting less and less um when it was like just a huge amount now a lot of them you know try to hide along the river and they've it's, they've gone along the river which is devastating in multiple ways a lot of those plants are needed for water to actually help clean the water in the rivers you know whether they're growing on the river or on the side of the river those plants are really really an important necessity to actually clean water in the river and they've gone and mowed and cut down all the trees in an effort to keep um, anyone from hiding in the bushes you know, or camping along the river. Um, yep, so yeah, we see that here too. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, they've, they've already been getting rid of people. They've already been taking, and remember this, do you remember this? So in 2008, you may have, you were probably in Taos still. So in 2008, yep. Oprah Winfrey does like everybody knew about it. The tent cities. This is where the word actually started coming from, and it was a lot. It was in Sacramento was the biggest problem along the Delta and some of the other areas, and they called them tent cities. Um, and these were the people that were middle class. These were the people that had full time jobs that worked in, you know, manufacturing or you know other jobs and lost their houses, and now were living in a tent city or their cars or their RVs. It was a huge amount of people, and. Oprah Winfrey did a piece on the tent cities. Well, like with, we watched within not a long period of time and all the reports we were getting. So Arnold Schwarzenegger, the governor of California at that time said, oh, all homeless people, please come to the um, oh, Cal Expo parking lot. You know, bring your cars and your RVs and bring everybody there. And we're going to help you. You know, we're going to give you stuff. We're going to help you. Um, and then the next thing you know, you don't hear about it anymore. Everybody shuts up about it. And all those people vanish. You know, all those RVs vanish. All those cars of those people living in them vanish. Um, they even, we went and looked at around the Delta, where a lot of people had been living. And they had cleaned it up and actually bulldozed it over. Like, you couldn't see anything. No remnants of a person, people actually living there. When there were huge encampments. And all of those people had to go somewhere. Right. Yeah. Where did they go? What, you know, yeah, like, what's just, happened to them? What's happened to all the stuff that they owned? Yeah. It just got th thrown away and who knows where they ended up. And well, you know, they, uh, there was an announcement a couple of years ago that there'd be uh, a 43,000 person facility at um, Camp Pendleton in, um, in Southern California. And then a Concord Naval Weapons Station, there'd be another 43,000 person camp for uh when they round up the refugees that's what they're the uh um, or you know undocumented workers but those camps are there but uh who's in them you know i don't know um or are they just like large empty camps and then at the uh 
there is an abandoned uh, prison at the end of the runway in Tucson that uh, huge, huge prison complex is abandoned next to three or four other, like a federal prison that is not abandoned and a couple of state prisons that are um, uh, that are um, fully operational. And I've always wondered, uh, when I lived in Tucson, why is there this huge uh, maximum security prison that only has one car parked out inside of it ever um, for the security guard basically watching this giant facility? And um, so, yeah, it's like uh, I, I think that we need to wake up to the fact that that, that we are in this kind of crisis. And, and the first people rounded up in uh, – Nazi Germany were the homeless and they were placed in the camps to work and it was supposed to be for their own good. And, um, they actually, uh, uh, on their uniforms, they had to wear a black triangle to, um, identify them as homeless people. Um, and they were, the, and the same language was used, uh, that they were drug addicts, um, um, uh, and mentally ill and so on. And, and that it was okay, uh, that they were work shy. They called them, um, that they were, uh, um, uh, useless eaters, that they were, you know, just eating food that could go to good Germans, you know, and they're not producing anything. So a lot of the language that we hear of hate, anti homeless hate groups and by political leaders is so reminiscent of that time. And people that I know that were in Germany at that time, uh, often will, uh, come to me and like, uh, you know, this is frightening. This is exactly what we saw when we were growing up and, uh, you should be concerned about that. And, um, so I, th- I think that that's a very important point in, in our history where we need to really speak up against this and push back and be aware of the possible, um, possibility that people really could be, um, interned in, in work camps. Uh, and I know what uh, the mayor of San, the person running for mayor of San Francisco, um, who ultimately was the harshest on the homeless and on food, not bombs, uh, uh, former chief of police, Frank Jordan, who became mayor of Frank Jordan. When he announced his candidacy, he, in, uh, I believe this was in, in uh, 1990, maybe a little before that. He, um, and first thing he said, he said, if I'm elected, I'll round up all the homeless people and I'll put them in a camp outside of the city with a sign over the entrance that says work shall make you free. And he ended up getting a huge amount of support from this uh, white supremacist group called the Sunset Boys. And the Sunset Boys were Irish American uh, youth uh, and older uh, Irish Americans who had, uh, whose families had originally uh, settled in, um, the uh, Sunset District of, of San Francisco, which was a district built specifically for dock workers um, back when dock workers unloaded the ships. But they uh, went into total economic collapse when containerized shipping happened. And so those people lost their houses and uh, um, they believed that they lost their houses to Asian Ameri- or Asians and were very angry about it. And so they were able to be mobilized by this uh, fascist uh, candidate for, for mayor who eventually did do what he called quality of life enforcement matrix program, and, um, and so, uh, which became this brutal campaign, one of the earliest of its kind, which was bolstered by, as I was saying in the first hour, this, um, uh, this, uh, uh, study called the broken window study and and then uh, what spun out of that the quality of life crimes um, and so we're get, we're seeing that pattern today with the homeless are on heroin and will never rent an apartment uh, therefore building housing is completely a waste of of uh, city resources and federal resources and just should not happen so I think this is the next step up, and that's why I'm so concerned about it. But also, that's why I'm really getting behind organizing uh, the the reestablishing the National Union of the Homeless because already I have seen in Santa Cruz since we since the Santa Cruz Homeless Union started, people living on the streets feeling a lot more um, self confident. 
and to believing that they do have rights and that they're full humans that should have the right to participate in society and um, and that they that they are economic and political refugees and not the failed individuals that corporate um, leaders and, and politicians are trying to portray them as. And uh, that, I think, will be, be very, very important. If you have five, six million people organized who uh, have a sense of dignity and realize that the reason that, that they're in the same boat with all the other uh, people, including the tenants who might be housed now but are facing a possibility of homelessness, that there could be a strong united front, and I uh, and the the new uh, uh, the reestablishment of the National Union of the Homeless is in alliance with the uh, Poor People's Campaign, which is seeking to organize the the nearly 50 percent of America that is in poverty, the 140 million Americans who are, are live at or below the poverty line, according to the federal government which, of course, is a way underestimate of the amount of people that are a paycheck away from the streets, and, um, you know, to push back. So on, on one hand, while this might be starting to be the, one of the, the darkest periods in U.S. history, it could also be one of the um, um, maybe most inspiring periods of time. And I'm like really excited the fact that Food Not Bombs is in hundreds of American cities and has been organizing for decades and has a track record of, of actually being one with the people living on the streets rather than being above. And that um, as a result, I'm able to push back and, um, you know, and do something. I, I'm a uh, radio interview, sorry. Um, yeah, so um, anyway, so that's the uh, issue is that, is, the push, is that we can really unite and push back and try to, um, you know, stop this kind of outrageous thing. So yes. humanizing the, the community of people living outside, like we are people, you know, we are the people that built America and therefore we should be treated with respect and dignity. And we uh, we built all the houses that are already here, so everybody should get to have access to housing, whether that means a livable wage. You know, say for instance here in Santa Cruz, you know that the minimum wage should be I think it's supposed to be uh, thirty eight dollars an hour. Wow! If you want to rent an apartment, a one bedroom apartment, um, or San Francisco, it's fifty-seven thousand. Uh, Fifty-seven dollars an hour should be the minimum wage in San Francisco, and um, so you know that's this uh, fight for fifteen. That's good. There should be fifteen dollars an hour across minimum wage across America, um, but that still wouldn't. You still couldn't afford to live in Santa Cruz or Reno. Los Angeles. Or, we, I mean, for Reno. like a, a nice, yeah. you know, I think. I was looking at for nice studio um, that had like a full refrigerator, not just a, you know, half a fridge or whatever. I mean, it was like around 800, I think a month, which is, you know, yeah. it's down like California, close to California, but California is like a little bit more extreme. So when you get, if you get any information, you know, as you're putting together the national homeless union, send it to me. Um, and then I will try to see if I can get, um, some people involved with, in Reno, um, we, we really need to have like a homeless union, you know, that we can actually have people to come together and actually at least start talking about the situation. Yeah, we could actually, um, I know Anthony and others here would be eager to come over and do a presentation, um, and, um, and, and talk about forming the Reno, uh, homeless union. And I Great. think that would be, that would be be really really very very valuable. I think I might I think we might be able to at the community one of the community centers we might be able to get on the docket to get a room like you know maybe put be able to put twenty people in it that we could have uh -huh. like some kind of presentation. But I could I could get the other food not bombs people to help me to put a lot of that together and then put out an event for it. 
and then so people come in and, and talk to the people if they want to come to Reno. Um, Great. That would be beautiful. Yeah, and, just let know, us know what a could, good day it is. Yeah, and another thing, too, it would be nice to get it where they could come out on the Monday night and just see what we're doing. Um, yeah, and, yeah. You know, like, just so I think that would be really encouraging for the Food Not Bombs Reno people. Um, yeah, so that would be a really great thing if we could put it together, like, you know, on a Sunday night, maybe the lecture and then, um, then your guys, your people could come and help, you know, with food on the Monday night, um, just to see what we're doing. But I think that would be yeah. a really great thing if possible, but I would really I'd like to, to try, that. Yeah, I might as well. I'm really good at projects. So <laughs> I'm really good with this kind of stuff. So, okay, so we're in, like, kind of the last 15 minutes. I mean, was there anything that you didn't get a chance to talk about that you were thinking about before you were going to come on the show? You know, kind of just going through your mental bag of thoughts or ideas or anything that you wanted to express that you haven't got to so far? Yeah, so the the, the uh, one of the things I'm doing now is I'm organizing, uh, I'm trying to encourage the uh, celebration on the 40th anniversary of Food Not Bombs. So, you know, we're organizing a concert here in Santa Cruz to celebrate the 40th anniversary. And then we're hoping to, uh, that every city, every chapter of Food Not Bombs does the same. So, um, you know, that, that When's the date? really, really, when is the date or kind of tentative and the date? date? Is, uh, we sort of found it on May 24th, uh, 1980. So that's a Sunday uh, this, uh, in May coming up. So we're hoping that we'll be able to to um, have concerts all around the world. And then we have another group that's organizing um, uh, uh, like a, a live stream of all these events to each other so that people could see the uh, event, um, you cool. know, what's happening in, in, in so Malaysia that, yeah. or the Philippines. So that's, um, that's going to be May 2020. Yep, May 2020. Yeah, okay. and we're um, we're really excited about that. That should be pretty uh, amazing. To um, so yeah. where where can people find you if if they want to get involved? Like, tell us what your email and Facebook oh, and me website. Where do they find me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, our uh, our website is foodnotbombs.net, and um, you, there's also a Food Not Bombs Global and Food Not Bombs Movement on Facebook. And then my Facebook is uh, Keith McHenry um, FNB, so I can be people can message me there. Um, my, I've, we have a toll free number called uh, it's uh, the Hunger Hotline one eight hundred eight eight four eleven thirty six, and um, so people can uh, uh, you know call me toll free from any payphone. Um, that's certainly uh, helpful. And, um, you know, so for instance, if you're listening to this and you're living on the streets, you can get a hold of me that way. Um, the uh, uh, email is uh, menu at foodnotbombs.net. So you can get a hold of us that, through that method. Um, those are all the ways. But the easiest thing is you just go to foodnotbombs.net. You'll be able to find, find me for sure. And uh, you'll be able to also find all your local chapters. If you are listening to this and you find that your chapter is not listed on foodnotbombs.net, then you're, you, uh, there, there's a uh, form right below the map where you can uh, input your information and have it come to, uh, um, to the person that uh, puts the map together, and therefore you'd be included in your uh, in the. Uh, uh, your chapter would be included on the Food Not Bombs World Contact List. So um, that's the ma main things I think that uh, that I wanted to get across. Is that we're in 1,000 cities. Uh, for instance, your chapter, uh, where the uh, Dabo um, Philippines chapter is celebrating, I believe it's 17th anniversary um, this uh, year on July 7th, and they're looking for statements from all the different Food Not Bombs chapters in support of their celebration. So if you get a chance to make like a little video or um, write a statement as uh, Reno Food Not Bombs, they'd be pretty excited about that or whatever chapter you're volunteering with. 
So, you know, this is a real opportunity um, to have a worldwide uh, resistance to things like the war uh, in Iran. Um, we have a protest today at four against the U.S. Um, war on Iran um, uh, to push back on the uh, policies that have forced so many people to live on the streets. Um, you know, that, uh, also to do things like uh, food, not lawns, gardening. And um, may, I think we may be, if the housing foreclosure crisis happens again, restart Homes Not Jails, where we take over abandoned buildings and homes and house ourselves in them. Um, you know, there's a, a lot of uh, um, nonviolent direct action campaigns that we can participate in to really turn things around and change society so that people aren't being pushed around for living in the streets and, and having to stand in long lines to get, you know, a meal. You know, I think we can really uh, turn things around. Yeah, and people don't realize, like, you know, um, we have, like, a major food crisis that's coming in the, in the United that? States as well. Um, people, um, you know... Um, are going to have to prepare for that. And I think that's going to be a real impact because even if people have the money to buy food, they're going to find that, you know, food is not a right and it's going to be hard to get. Yeah, exactly. And that's going to yeah, start changing be, people rapidly. Yeah, it's going to uh, all, uh, make it, uh, I think that, well, as has happened in the past, uh, in fact, already happens on, on kind of smaller scales, which is one of the things about uh, harassing Puna bombs is to, um, you know, to withhold food to starve populations out so that, uh, and then try to drive them to other locations. You know, that's been the strategy of cities since 88 is to try to get people to, um, um, just to leave uh, commercial areas by luring them with free meals on the edges of cities that then get cut off when it's time to get rid of even those people. So yeah, it's, it's pretty major disaster. Yeah. One of the one of the big things that I learned uh, last year about homeless and homeless encampments, this year I go a lot if I get extra food, like canned food and whatever else I get. And, you know, I usually will um, take it to the encampment, but I, I just go to the edge where they can see me and I drop it off. But one of the things I learned is that, you know, the homeless people, they have encampments and it's like, you know, just because it doesn't have the walls around it doesn't mean that you know, you should just go traipsing in there um, to see what they need. But, you know, maybe, right. you know, slowly come up to their house and their population and just say, hey, I'd really like to help you. You know, what can I help you with? Um, I can just leave it here on the border. If I leave it here, right here, you guys will see it and pick it up um, kind of a thing um, so that you uh -huh. can take your excess stuff to them and you can help them. But, you know, just because they don't have doors and walls, they, they feel offended when you go tramping into their, you know, living room. Um, exactly. Because, yeah. People need you know, to respect that. You know, it's safe. Yeah. It, it provides safety for them because otherwise they're yeah. instantly under threat because they think that you're going to harm them. Exactly. Yep. And it, which makes sense, you know. Um, yeah. People should, should fear that. Yeah, yeah. But a lot of people don't understand that. You know, they um, don't. No. They don't respect themselves. They haven't taught, been taught respect, and so they don't respect other people. And even in an attempt to help them, sometimes we end up threatening them. And so we have to be really careful, you know, about that yeah. kind of behavior. And at the same time, be able to help them in whatever, you know, way we can. Yep, yeah, exactly. Yep. Yeah. So unfortunately, um, I should probably go because I know okay. I'm getting a bunch of volunteers arriving <laughs> to do the kitchen, and so. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, well keep it's been me wonderful, up. Bridget, to be yeah, on Yeah, thank you so much. We'll just keep rotating you in periodically, and and um, you know, picking your brain for what's going on, and you know, he's hands on on the ground. Keith McHenry, and so he knows a lot about these issues. He's been involved with them for a long, long time. And so I just really appreciate you taking the time to be on the show and, um, and, and let me know, hook me up with the people I need to hook up with for the uh, homeless um, union and we'll see if we can get something um, shaking in Reno and we'll have your people meet with my people. <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> Beautiful. Okay. That sounds fantastic. All right. Thank Keith. you so much. Take have a care. great day. You too. 
All right, everybody. That was uh, Keith McHenry, one of the founding fathers of um, Food Not Bombs. He was talking about they're having the um, 40th year anniversary of Food Not Bombs. Um, they're hoping to do like a worldwide celebration, uh, May 2020. So that'll be really interesting. And um, I will keep you abreast of what happens with the homeless union that um, that will be an interesting thing to see how that's going to shake out. I bet you it's not going to be <laughs> taken very well here in the Reno area. I mean, I think there'll be a lot of people who get involved with it and it might grow really rapidly, but you know, the powers that be are probably not going to really like it a whole lot. Um, but that's okay. It's not like I haven't been on the, um, the fringe, you know, I live on the fringe. So anyway, this is, um, carrying stones and digging holes radio show with Bridget Lynn Dolgoff. And you are listening to revolution radio, freedomslips.com. And you can go to revolution radio, freedomslips.com. And you can click on our funding and find out all kinds of amazing ways that you can fund us to help us keep our shows going and what we provide you and, um, all the amazing people that are behind the scenes that are doing all the volunteering operational and technical, um, um, things, um, so be really great if you could help us with our funding and there are multiple ways to do funding. I actually advertise on uh, revolution radio, freedomslips.com. I have a banner for uh, holistic and alternative healthcare by Bridget Lynn Dolgoff. And I do online sessions by zoom. Um, and I've been involved in alternative healthcare for a really long time. And I am pretty good at it. And uh, I focus is um, nutrition and, um, now herbal medicine and, um, also, uh, you know, major problems, major illness. And so I specialize in pain and autoimmune system type diseases and also, um, inflammation. Those are kind of like my key areas. Um, also I use multiple methods to make that happen. Um, I do a lot of seated energetic work. I do a lot of different types of, um, healing work on top of um, structural and um, obviously online. It's more of a um, consulting or helping with nutrition and diet and other, other kinds of concepts and healing sessions. And just for those people out there, I do have quite a few clients that I see online that are MK Ultra. So um, I work a lot with energetic integration and also shamanism type teaching support and practices. Um, and um, I'm really like focusing on helping people um, integrate, you know, um, unifying all themselves and their systems and the body into uh, working in perfection. So um, my website is down because GoDaddy has seriously done a number on us. So my website, COE-LLC, I hope will be up once it gets migrated by HostGator. Thank God for HostGator. Um, should be after the first week of July, and you could go there. Also, I'm going to be um, doing phenomenology, mini phenomenology course um, for probably about a six-month period, two classes a month. Um, if people are interested in spiritual study, um, and it's mostly like spiritual science type study, you know, of the environment, um, learn things you never knew and integrate your brain into a whole brain function, um, and, um, learn some pretty amazing things, um, from my phenomenology classes. And also I will be having, as soon as my website gets up, I also will be able to put a page up for the herbal medicines that I'm making while crafting um, for pain and autoimmune system disease and inflammation um, for people. So hopefully I'll be able to get that page up once my website gets back under control and um, it gets to a new server. So anyway, it was 20 days for um, the migration to happen just because there was like a huge drove of people who are being, um, you know, their websites were being kind of um, held hostage by certain um, companies, server companies. So um, it's going to take just a little bit more time. So that's all good. Anyway, so um, this is Bridget Lynn Dolgoff. I am the host of Carrying Stones and Digging Holes radio show. Just a reminder uh, for next week, which is going to be July 6th, I have uh, Ralph Ring and Marsha Brown Ring back on. Um, 
two amazing human beings and last time we tried to get them on they had a, a problem it seems that the powers that be just really did not want them talking about anything that they were doing or what was going on or what happened in paradise to them so this time we're going to make sure that we get them squared away right away and i'm going to spend up to an hour before the show so we have two hours that are dedicated to them uh, next week. So really excited about having them on again. Anyway, thanks so much, everybody. Caring Stones and Digging Holes radio show. Bridget Lynn Dogoff. See you next week. Bye. You don't know nothing about Lady Liberty standing there in the hub with her torch on high, screaming out to all the nations in the world, send me your poor, your deadbeats, your filthy. <laughs> and all the nations sent them in here. They come swarming in like ants. Your Spanish PRs from the Caribbean there. Your Japs, your Chinamen, your Crouch and your Heaves, and your leaving Spanish. <laughs> Come in here, and they're all free to live in their own separate sections. Where they feel safe, and they bust your head if you go in there. That's what makes America great, buddy. Extendivite really works. Just listen to what some people have to say. Several years ago, I was developing a very uh, severe situation. I called it my flippy heart. It would just was doing not good things. And I did not want to go to a medical doctor because uh, I just knew they would give me a cover-up pill. I didn't want to get onto that sort of thing at all. When I learned it was garlic and cayenne, and cayenne is a healer. It is a wonderful herb. I said, I think I'm on to something here. I'll tell you, I wouldn't be without it. It did wonderful things for me. Extendivite is only $69.95 for a two-month supply of either capsules or liquid. Call now. That's 1-877-928-8822 or visit partdrop.com. Extend your life with Extendovite. The opinions expressed on this radio station, its programs, and its website by the hosts, guests, and call-in listeners or chatters are solely the opinions of the original source who expressed them. They do not necessarily represent the opinions of Revolution Radio and FreedomSlips.com, its staff, or affiliates. You're listening to Revolution Radio, FreedomSlips.com, 100% listener-supported radio, and now we return you to your host, Revolution. 